I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Laura McGifford Slover. I'm the Vice President for Content and Policy Research here at Achieve. Um, I have with me today Pat Wright, who is the Superintendent of Public Instruction in Virginia. To her, uh, oh, I started in the middle. Uri Treisman, sorry, Executive Director, Charles A. Dana Center. And Tony Bright, who's the President of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And I know that all of you have heard from these folks uh, out there in the world a lot, and we're really thrilled that you all could be with us so early in the morning. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a couple minutes to frame the session, and then, and really, I don't want to talk too long because I want you to hear directly from the experts. Um, the session this morning is on multiple pathways through high school mathematics, and the discussion really is going to come uh, very, become very focused quickly on are there rigorous alternatives to Algebra 2? And we're holding this session because of your interest, interest in states around this precise question about whether there are alternative pathways through high school mathematics that provide students with the rigorous content they need to be successful in college and careers. And we know that there, there's a lot of data that show that advanced mathematics is critical for success in college and work, and a lot of that data comes from Achieve. We did a two-year research study uh, that was really the, provided the foundation for the American Diploma Project benchmarks, in which we surveyed professors and employers about what was most important for success in college and in high-skilled careers. And after two years of focus groups and, and really detailed work, we developed a set of benchmarks um, that, that ha include in it the content that we heard from that research was the most important. And that includes geometry, number, data analysis, statistics, and of course, algebra. Uh, and when we looked to see what courses uh, that content was typically taught in, in high schools across the country, for the most part, we saw a traditional course path sequence uh, that included Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and some data analysis and statistics. And so states, as they looked around, um, as they moved very quickly to put in place course requirements that would provide a good foundation for students and ensure that they were ready for college and careers, naturally um, tended to put in place a sequence of courses that reflected that traditional sequence. That's not true in every case, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But we've seen a rapid uptake on a course requirement um, through Algebra 2 and in some cases beyond. 19 states and the District of Columbia now require all students, or, or have um, plan to require, have laws on the books, so to speak, uh, that their students, in order to graduate, complete a course sequence through or beyond Algebra 2. So that's the landscape we're currently working in. We know, however, that there are alternative ways of delivering um, and teaching rigorous mathematics. And in, in fact, um, a number of states have model courses that are um, integrated courses. For example, Indiana. Indiana has a uh, sequence that they have two sequences. They have a traditional course sequence, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. And they also have an integrated course sequence. Um, integrated Math 1, Integrated Math 2, Integrated Math 3. ADP, as we back mapped the ADP benchmarks, we too uh, provided some alternative pathways. We did a traditional course sequence and a much more integrated course sequence. And we actually dabbled in thinking through what an applied sequence would look like. And that uh, was really exciting and a little bit challenging for us. There are not a lot of good models out there. Um, Georgia. Georgia's taken an interesting step. Georgia's entire uh, course requirements is, is built around an integrated model. They have an integrated one, integrated two, integrated three model. And internationally, when you look at what other countries do, they approach mathematics quite differently, um, both in sort of the, the Asian countries and in the UK-based countries. They have a much more integrated model, um, either a math A, B, and C sequence or a math one, two, three sequence. Couple that with a changing landscape at the higher education, in the higher ed world, where um, college algebra is still the most frequently taken course, but as Uri will attest to, that landscape is changing as well, and more and more students are entering college and taking different kinds of mathematics courses, particularly in statistics. You put that all together, and we have um, a changing world, and we still want kids to get through rigorous mathematics, but Many of you are raising the question about whether a traditional course sequence is the only way to do that. And so we've put together a panel who want for, 
to talk about some alternative models. And I'm going to start at, by asking Pat Wright to speak about what has happened in Virginia. They've put together a, a really exciting alternative course um, called Advanced Functions and Data Analysis, and that has gotten some legs. And why don't you come up here and talk about what you did, uh, how that's working, and, and what you've learned. Good morning. Thanks, Laura. Uh, and everyone in the audience, you get a gold star for being bright and early this morning, 7.30. Of course, the Chiefs have been up all night, uh, I know, so you're just in your midday uh, right now. I want to acknowledge my Virginia delegation. I see uh, uh, Board President Mark Imblage in the audience and our Secretary of Education, Tom Morris, and I want to thank them for their support. I have a lot of freedom to, to be creative, especially in mathematics. Uh, first, I want to disclose that uh, my perspective is really from uh, two areas, and sometimes I'm not real sure which hat I'm wearing. Um, as a professional, I'm actually a professional mathematics educator, which I really am not able to ever take that hat off. And of course, then there's the uh, state superintendency. So I, you know, the the idea of an alternative to uh, a rigorous alternative to algebra two. I have to tell you, really came, uh, I, I suppose, from that perspective of a mathematics educator, having spent 34 years uh, working in mathematics. Uh, but also, um, for the last um, decade uh, in, the, in the policy area uh, at, the, at the state agency in various uh, roles. We uh, began the conversation about uh, an alternative to um, a rigorous course in Algebra II uh, in 2006. So we've been mucking around uh, with this topic for, for quite a while. Uh, but I think to understand why we went in this direction uh, with a new course called Algebra Functions and Data Analysis, you really have to understand the context uh, for Virginia because everything is relative to the state. Um, it, it's always nice to pick up great ideas from other states, but you've got to be able to embed it within the, your own context, knowing your own policies, your own uh, standards, your own graduation requirements. And, of course, in Virginia, we've, we, like most states, have been um, in a standards-based reform movement for some time. In fact, you know, uh, in 1995, I would call it a revolution on standards, and that's where we really created uh, a rigorous set of mathematics standards, particularly at the high school level, and where we dumped all of the general mathematics courses and we really moved to Algebra One as the entry-level uh, course. And that was back in the day, uh, Yuri, when it was Algebra for All. So back in the day, we were mucking around uh, with this idea of more rigorous uh, high school mathematics courses. Well, what ended up uh, in 95, which led to uh, uh, our accountability reform in 98 with stringent graduation requirements around these standards and courses, is that our Algebra II course or in, and our Algebra II trig courses became very, very rigorous. And I think that that really uh, came out a decade later when we were working with the American Diploma Project in the review of our Algebra II uh, standards of learning in Virginia. Uh, and working with the College Board and the ACT. And all three organizations indicated to us that, wow, these are rigorous uh, standards. And while we were missing uh, elements of the uh, data analysis and the probability and statistics content that you'll find in the ADP benchmarks, we were exceeding, uh, we were exceeding the college success benchmarks for the College Board and ACT and in some ways uh, uh, the American Diploma Project with this set of standards. And that really, really points home the, um, the, the reason back in 1998 when we raised our graduation requirements and required Algebra I and Geometry for all students that we didn't make Algebra II a graduation requirement for all because I knew they were rigorous. I knew they were rigorous standards. The Board of Education at that time knew they were rigorous. And it was not, the, the course wasn't intended for all students. It really was intended for those students headed to a four-year uh, institution. Well, since, since that time, we have been doing a lot around career and technical education. In fact, we're, we have a massive industry certification movement. And obviously, when, you, when you're driving more students to uh, high-tech high tech, uh, fields and pushing the integration of academics and CTE, you want to make sure that those students who are not headed immediately to a four-year institution have a rigorous uh, alternative to Algebra II. Because the Algebra II course we have right now uh, is, is not 
the most appropriate course for the students in the industry certification uh, pathway. But I wanted to make sure that I did not take a pathway, take an option away from students. I always want to make sure that any student who's on a technical uh, pathway, career and technical pathway, can move back over into a more four-year institution-oriented uh, pathway immediately. And so the, in designing this course in 2006 and 2007, we made sure that uh, about 95% of all the Algebra II content was included in our new course. The big difference between, the biggest difference between this new course and the traditional Algebra II is the approach. And while as a mathematics educator, I can say that, well, any good teacher should be able to take a set of standards and modify the approach and make it more contextual for these learners, you know, after decades of saying that and talking it, and we, we weren't able to implement it. I mean, I've been a high school mathematics teacher, so I know how difficult that is. And so rather than trying to, uh, which would, would lead to what I think an unintended consequence of having a watered down Algebra II experience for those students who really were, uh, were needing uh, that intensive, more abstract uh, Algebra II, uh, we created this new course. But it's a very rigorous course. It is a transformational modeling. And so I could throw out a bunch of terminology that Yuri could explain uh, later. Uh, but basically, it's based on, it's a functional approach Graphical, mathematical modeling, transformation. Everything that's in this course is you take just about all the content of a, of a traditional Algebra II course, but the approach is from a transformation graphical representation model, and it's very much data-oriented. Now, we were missing, in our traditional uh, Algebra II course, we were missing many of the ADP benchmarks around uh, data analysis, probability and statistics, because you know, in a very rigorous Algebra II course, it's very difficult to get all of the data analysis and the statistics content within that course in the timelines uh, allotted. And of course, the mathematics teachers were complaining heavily that we don't want to turn an Algebra II course into a statistics course. But for this particular course, we're able to take the ADP benchmarks and take take um, the robust content from, from probability and statistics and embed it within this course so that it, so that it can be delivered in a uh, graphical uh, manner, uh, mathematical modeling, a lot of applications, uh, real world applications, uh, business applications, and applications from other uh, content areas. Well, that's a long way of saying that we have a rigorous uh, algebra uh, functions data analysis course that uh, is an alternative for our career and technical education students, but it also could be a bridge course. It could be a bridge course for those students who are headed to a four-year institution that need a little bit more time to handle our Algebra II course because it, even though we have revised those standards, and actually we took out some content at the recommendation of uh, Achieve and the College Board, uh, we took out some of the college uh, content, and um, uh, we have modified it a little bit. It is still, uh, it is still intended to be uh, taught from a more abstract uh, point of view, uh, abstract theory and algebraic uh, modeling versus graphical uh, modeling. Uh, so it, it can be a bridge course for those students who need a little bit more time to be successful with our uh, traditional Algebra II, uh, or for those students who think they're going to a two-year college with our Algebra Functions Data Analysis but change their mind and they want to go to a four-year institution. So it could be a bridge course or it could be a terminal course for those students headed to a two-year college. Uh, when Achieve reviewed our Algebra Functions Data Analysis Standards, they, they did indeed determine that students that are headed to a two-year college, our community colleges in particular, should not need remedial uh, coursework. And that's a, that's a big hurdle for us, uh, like most of you in, in your states, trying to reduce the, uh, the number of students in remedial courses. Uh, after developing the standards, of course, you have to set some policies in motion. Of course, you, you need to think about the policies ahead of time, not after the fact. We knew we were going to have some uh, technical diplomas. We knew we wanted them to be uh, rigorous. We wanted to uh, make sure we didn't have any unintended consequences with students headed to a four-year institution uh, termin terminating, trying to terminate with this course. So we changed our graduation requirements. We removed any loopholes we, uh, that would, um, would allow 
allow the four-year intended student to, uh, term, to, be, to, to, earn, uh, to earn this uh, course credit as, the, as their terminal course. Uh, all of our students headed to the four-year institutions need the Algebra II and beyond. Uh, there is no question about that. But we're very clear. I think transparency is important. Be very clear about the intent of the course so that you don't in, unintentionally have student, you drive students uh, to, uh, to a set of standards or a course uh, where they actually need um, a, a, a different type uh, of approach. So I'll stop right there and um, turn it back over to Laura. Thanks, Pat. And Pat's right. We, we did um, review that course, and we found it to be a really interesting and robust course. So um, we hope you'll take a look at it. Um, Uri, could you come talk a little bit about the fourth-year capstone course that you're developing in Texas? as well as just the shifting dynamics that you've talked to this group about before in the college landscape and what's happening there. And you'll help me find my slides. Oh. But not yet. Um, yeah, you talk. I'll find oh, okay. Uh, good morning. Um, it was good to hear Pat uh, remind us of the algebra for all idea. And now when we look back on this dream of algebra for all, in Hayward, California, it takes 2.4 tries for the average student to complete Algebra 1. In Texas, we have a growing number of districts where the mean number of attempts is approaching two. So as my friend David Foster at the Noyce Foundation said, our dream of Algebra for All has become for kids Algebra Forever. <laughs> um, what we have is a shifting landscape between high school and college mathematics. And it's not just shifting, it's a, tech, speaking of California, tectonic plate. More students take calculus in high school now than college, and that's been true for three years, and the difference is growing. So we used to think of building the preparatory courses for calculus, actually more students take calculus in high school than college. In states that promote it, statistics is growing like wildfire. In community colleges, 6% of enrollments are calculus, 9% already is statistics. Statistics is growing quickly. So we have a changing landscape. And most of it is really healthy and good, and Achieve has played an incredibly important role in it. In most of our states, students are coming to higher ed with at least a year, if not two years more mathematics than they did 15 years ago. This is a massive transformation, democratization of access to courses that used to be the province of a privileged few. But when we look at higher ed data, at least in those few states where you can actually figure out what's going on in higher education, right? Florida, North, uh, Texas, uh, Ohio to some extent, North Carolina. We see no substantive reduction in the failure rates in courses. 1.2 million students a year in four-year comprehensives take college algebra. 50% of them fail it. In many community college systems, two-thirds of students withdraw or fail college algebra. And what's so painful is that when you go around and look at these courses, full of aspiring nurses, policemen, firemen, EMTs. None of them actually need the content of that course. So the weight of history is weighing heavily on the moment. So as we move forward to democratize access to mathematics, to really important courses, as we start requiring that all students actually take math every year of school, we had better make sure that our goals are right and that they're taking the mathematics that they will actually need. So if you need college algebra, you need calculus. And if you need calculus, this is my 50th year of teaching calculus. So I love that <coughs> subject. <coughs> if you need calculus, you need at least a year or year and a half more than calculus to actually use it. Nobody uses one variable calculus for anything. So we can't build a gigantic pathway where everybody is headed to a track for engineers or economists. It's time to actually have a meaningful validation for them. So when Achieve brought people together, and I share some of the responsibility here, as Mike will point out, 
When you convene mathematicians to tell you what's important, what are they going to say? The mathematics they had in high school. Huh? Deciding what the right goals are is too important to be left just to my profession. Huh? We need to have everyone in the room when we think about what students need to participate in the world mathematically as intelligent citizens. And the answers are not rocket science. They need algebra. They need some geometry. They need some algebra, too. Right? But they also need a lot more knowledge about how to manage and make sense of data, how to use mathematics to model certain situations, how to use mathematics in support of causal reasoning. And it's time to build the infrastructure. Virginia is out in front, as it usually is on these things, really creative work. In Texas, more than 60 districts are working with us and seven states to build an advanced mathematical decision-making course. We have mathematical mo models courses spreading in many states. And here's the problem. Almost half of the courses, if not more, become e high school exit exam preps because there's no accountability for those courses and there are no instruments to check the quality of them. So when we build two pathways, which is what Singapore does. Everyone goes through about the 10th grade together. Then there's two pathways, a data-heavy pathway like your course, like our AMDM course, and a more rigorous pathway to calculus. When it works well, we build the alternative data course so that students, if they change their mind, can go back in to Algebra 2, a traditional rigorous Algebra 2 course, as a senior or as a junior, depending on whether they take algebra. If we do that, which we have to now, before we lock in rock and petrify a system that is about history and not the future, we better make sure that there are quality tools, quality assurance tools for those courses. So in end of course exam states, we need to make sure there are end of course exams, or those courses will just be lower track courses that really threaten our collective equity goals. Now let's just look at the college side. So most of the Achieve work is framed, a lot of the Gates work is framed as, here's high school, you finish it, then you go to college. As I pointed out, what used to be college freshmen is now taken in high school, and what used to be middle school is now taken in college. This is the tectonic plate. <laughs> I just want to show you one piece of data. And Vanna White, my oh. thought partner, and... Hopefully. I thought that was it. Oh, sorry. Here it is. Only one slide, but it's a nasty one. Okay, so think of this like an operatic prop. I'm actually a real teacher. I don't just play one at a team. <laughs> Florida, which has such a great data system, you can actually answer basic questions. This is all, so in community college in Florida, there was a placement test, and there's a state-determined score. If you don't make that score, you take developmental math. If you do take it, you go on in a regular college track course. So when you look in the upper left-hand corner, that vertical line represents the passing score for the placement test. All the students to the right, now some students get out of doing it and so on, but all students to the right are just, you know, these are students taking college algebra. Zero means they just passed the cutoff score. And to the right, there are people who took 30, got 30 points more than they needed on the placement test. All the people to the left took developmental math, and now we're looking at their placement, uh, their scores in college algebra. So what you see here, if developmental math and all our remediation in college were effective, you would see it making a big difference. People just below the cutoff line would have benefited and they would do better in college algebra. But what you actually see in Texas data, Ohio data, and Florida data is virtually no difference. Our remedial programs aren't working. And more important, even students with extraordinarily high scores are failing college algebra more than half of them in Florida. 55% of them are failing college algebra, even though they have almost perfect scores on the placement test. This is like Old Testament bad. 
frogs, rivers of blood, locusts, right? We're not, we're not just talking bad. So we have all these folks failing this, and we've anchored these things for our nurses, our future nurses who we need so desperately in a course that no one cares about and they'll never use. So just as in high school, we have to build two pathways of high quality that allow flexibility that are porous. In college, we need to do what our higher ed commissioner did, Raymond Paredes, and rewrote the administrative code so that statistics can count as a credit-bearing transferable college course. Right? And we need to have validation work going on, not controlled by math departments exclusively that present better evidence for why we set our prerequisites and why we set what our freshman requirements are. Big picture, Achieve has done a magnificent job of defining the Algebra two you need for a STEM pathway. What we need Achieve to do now is to lay out with the same rigor and same consensus process what the other pathway should look like and how to ensure that this transferability and that students can move from one into the other, supporting the Virginia intuitions, which I think are exactly right, and what Singapore and other high-performing countries do. Thank you. Thank you, Uri. Um, so that was a great segue. I really appreciate um, First of all, I appreciate many points that you made in supporting the, the Virginia approach and pointing out how important it is to not have such a course, if you do have one, become just a, a test prep and, and a meaningless um, alternative, less rigorous, less meaningful um, approach, but rather to make it sure that it has the full force of the accountability system behind it. Um, uh, Superintendent Wright talked about the, the, the uh, end of course exam that they're building for that course um, to make it really matter and to, and to send signals to kids that they have to take that course seriously. Um, I want to uh, shift to Tony Bright. Tony's going to talk a little bit, um, it's a great segue, in, in, in this landscape of shifting post-secondary um, uh, courses and requirements and, and really uh, shifting in terms of what students are studying, um, how do you create on-ramps to that if, if, the, if the goal is, is not clear and the target is changing? And Tony's been doing some work um, to create newly designed courses that will create an on-ramp into to the shifting demands of post-secondary education. If I can find his presentation. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good morning. Um, I've been at the foundation just about a year, and my main task is to try to figure out the program of work for the, this foundation for the next decade or longer. And my remarks this morning are really in the context of that journey, but it will take us back to the central question of this session. First of all, often thinking about our context, as we talk about more ambitious academic attainment for all students and this profound effect of this knowledge economy in which we live in and the larger so uh, social and technical changes that are upon us, we're talking about profound changes in our educational system doing more for many more than ever before. But there's now a second piece that's also quite clear. And we're gonna be doing it in a context going forward where there's going to be a fierce competition for public resources. Um, which means that not only must we be more ambitious in what we're striving for, we have to have systems that are, systems that are much more efficient in attaining those goods. Either one of these would be a very ambitious reform agenda. The two of them together is extraordinary. When you think about the problem in this way, it immediately, for me, starts to think about, well, what is our capacity to actually inform reform? And we actually have a blizzard of activity that occurs out in the field, what might broadly be called innovation for improvement. It happens in, uh, it, it's, it's catalyzed by the work of individual foundations. It's catalyzed by local institutions. It occurs, it's occurring under the aegis of individual faculty in the academy. But all of this activity is very incoherent. And most to the point, it doesn't add up. It's not accumulating in fundamental improvements in the way we educate. So the, the bottom line 
as I think about this, is that our current educational R&D system will not get us to these ambitious goals that we confront in the decade ahead. What we need to form are something more akin to what we've started calling networked improvement communities. But these improvement communities must share four characteristics. First, the work they do must actually be centered on specific problems, on identifying those problems, and actually making measurable improvements on problems. So they're problem-centered. The work involves a, an engineering process of prototyping things, trying them out, retrying them, refining them. Very different than just saying, I built it, I got some results, go do it. Um, it involves co-development. It's a recognition that the expertise for solving these problems exists in a variety of places. Yes, there's expertise in the academy, but there's real expertise in your districts and schools and in your institutions. We need to figure out how to make this expertise work better together on improvement problems. And we also need to recognize that there's often real expertise in the commercial sector, and we need to figure out how to make this expertise partner around solving real problems. It recognizes this extraordinary new development also in the context of open educational resources and how to actually, uh, how to actually engage that toward productive ends going forward. And it sets the task, not just simply in creating something that works someplace, but it sets the task in trying to figure out how to make any innovation work reliably. When you take it to different contexts, you put it in the hands of different individuals, who may be engaging somewhat different kinds of students. This variability runs all through our practice, but we really make addressing it a core problem. All right. Now, in thinking about this kind of problem-centered work, we've begun to focus as a main priority the work of the foundation going forward on developmental mathematics in community colleges. Well, why this, quickly? It's a major institution for advancing social equity, and fueling 21st century labor needs. Um, this is where the disproportionate number of our minority students, low-income students, students from uh, families where neither parent has had a post-secondary education, this is where they go. Uh, yet many students along this route find their path to success blocked by this algebra forever uh, phenomena that, that uh, Uri re referred to. But I would also say it's a bridge problem, because the problem of instruction that we encounter in developmental education mathematics is basically the same problem that starts in our middle schools and in our high schools. This is all of one fabric. So let's take the wall down between these two institutions and figure out how to affect greater success for larger numbers of students. The race to the top doesn't end at grade 12. When we look at the data, uh, this problem is everywhere. 60% of the students enrolling in community colleges take remedial classes. In some places, they're almost entirely low-income minority students. In many institutions, of the students moving into these remedial courses, fewer than 20% of them ever get out. This is literally a system designed for failure because almost everybody fails. Now, there are many different claims about the problem and what might be promising solutions. And a quick sampler. Well, starts with the placement tests. Uh, and these, these placement tests ha have a critical role in what happens to students. And so some say we should work on summer bridge programs. Others say we have an incoherent, coherent structure, curriculum structure, which is an argument we endorse, including way too many course hurdles that create many places to fail. Uh, Another argument, we're out of touch with our 21st century students and how they learn and how we use technology. This is, a, this is a social support problem. We have very weak counseling services, and as a result, many students fall through the cracks before we even know it. We're not allocating our best people to our toughest problems. Much of, many of these remedial courses are taught by adjunct faculty, and so we have a question of whether we have our best resources on our hardest problems. We have weak instructional practices. This is the faculty side of the algebra over and over again. They didn't get it once. They didn't get it twice. We'll do it again. Maybe we'll do it louder. 
Um, and we have students who are often weakly connected to the, to the institutions. They are weakly connected to their students, to their peers, to their institutions, all of which contributes to these high failure rates. But perhaps most significant of all in the context of today's discussion is the question of whether we're actually targeting the right learning goals for many of our students. So in thinking about the work of Carnegie, this becomes our big orienting question. What is it that students actually need to know and do for success in the work and life? Um, and how much of this do they actually know when they come into community colleges? As you ask this question, it's really reasonable to ask the question, is it really more content for more students along this pathway to calculus that Uri's talked about? Or would robust instructional systems where all students attain a basic understanding of deep concepts of algebra, arithmetic, geometry, attain procedural fluency and use, and are able to apply these fundaments to analyzing basic problems in work and personal life. Couple this with statistics, data analysis, and quantitative reasoning. And here when you ask the question as, a, as an organizational sociologist, I want to ask, well, what's the work that students are really doing in disciplines, in various occupational preparation programs, even for that matter, in professional preparation programs? When you think about what you do in your daily life, probably most of you, unless you teach mathematics, don't factor trinomials or, or, or um, solve simultaneous quadratic equations. But almost every day in your professional life, you encounter statistics. You engage in, in forms of analysis of data, productions of information along this, side, uh, this type, engaging causal reasoning with quantitative evidence. This is the mathematics for many occupations. This is the mathematics for many professions, law, uh, general manage business, um, uh, those who go into educational administration, uh, medicine, and so on. And finally, I would argue this is the mathematics for citizenship because it's the mathematics that underlies the making of decisions under uncertainty in this increasingly complex life we share in the commons. So if there's a plausible argument, at least, about this as an alternative pathway, then the question is how do we actually structure an improvement network organized around making real headway on this problem? And I would argue we need to do four things. First, and very much in the spirit of ACHIEVE, we need a common analytic framework for organizing this local work. Second, we need common measures, and by this, not just common outcome measures, but particularly as we think about students coming to the community college doorstep, many of these individuals know a lot of things, but we ignore and we don't pay much attention to what they already know. So we need to have a much stronger understanding about students' background, knowledge, if we're actually going to tailor what happens for them next and be more efficient in doing this. And we also need evidence about the core processes we're tackling, trying to advance improvement. We need a shared technical capacity to support and build local capacity. And we need to figure out how to link together a community of participation in this improvement efforts. And especially in the post-secondary arena, this is very much of, I got to build it myself. And while some wonderful things will get built that way, we'll, have, we'll continue to maintain enormous variability uh, in the outcomes of these processes if we don't figure out how to network improvement and learn through these processes. All right, so what we're thinking about is, again, starting with this issue of targeting the wrong learning goals and then moving back and really asking the critical questions about what is it we need to know about our students and building an evidence base around that. We need to follow our way through this path uh, in trying to think about, well, how do we use technology well in this regard? How do we make this co curriculum coherent? How do we work on student support issues? How do we engage faculty to learn to be able to teach this new content well to the variety of students who are walking through the front door? And then ultimately, how do we measure what is it that students are learning and how they're engaging this subject matter in our institutions? Because this last evidence isn't just telling us what we've accomplished, it's the essential data to feed back into a continuous improvement networked community. This is the kind of work we're trying to advance at the foundation. So what we 
have this kind of program improvement map of the type I've just illustrated, try to forge more active partnerships uh, between the academy, community colleges, districts, states working on these problems, create an open, edu an open resources infrastructure so that what's learned is made accessible uh, quickly to others. And then surround this, I always love this little kind of thing you do with PowerPoint, you know, make these things spin around. <laughs> Absolutely useless, but anyway. And then surround this with ongoing engagement with institutional and civic leaders who can support this kind of continuous improvement network community over time. Uh, at the core of this, as you think about building this network, is some genuine expertise around instruction, uh, the core practices of instruction around assessments, not only assessments in terms of the uh, systematic outcomes, but also the embedded formative assessments. What I started, this is a word that I actually think has now been so overused, formative, that I've actually started calling it informative assessment. That is assessment that actually informs instruction rather than just kind of weighs it over and over again. Uh, how are we gonna support faculty learning? Thinking about these, any of these innovations as they as they try to go to scale, almost invariably have learning problems at the heart of them. How do we help faculty get better at this? And recognizing that these are profound organizational changes in, in the ways individual work and in the culture of institutions. Cutting across this, if you think about the capacities, asking questions about where and how technology could add value. Recognize that even as you think about mathematics, at the heart of mathematics learning, are often problems of literacy and language, and that that becomes another capacity, technical capacity that needs to undergird a network. And again, finally, this idea that this is a problem of continuous improvement, and so you have to have you have to develop knowledge and manage information structures to drive all of this. So in the end, the goal is to try to actually create a workable pathway along the lines of what Uri has been talking about informed by strong data, organized around a network improvement community so that we actually could achieve measurable success on a statistics pathway for many more of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> that gave you a lot, of, lot to think about, and I want to give you all a chance to ask questions. So I'm just going to ask one question to our panel. Um, which is there are state leaders in the room who want to do something, they want to take action. What are some quick wins that they can, what are some actionable um, steps that they can take, each one of you, um, to move them towards thinking through um, diverse pathways through high school math? Can we, we'll just go for these um, work. <coughs> okay, so um, efforts to change curriculum are really hard. It's like carrying bones from one graveyard to another. <laughs> right? So if the most important thing to, so just very quickly, the wonderful young scholar Adriana Kazar has studied 600 proposals for changing core higher ed practices. And she found that all of them tend to focus on only one area of the system. If we're gonna build more responsible core pathways, we need to involve governance, state policy, institutional leadership, and faculty action. And we need to think about this as a joyful conspiracy. <laughs> Coordinate initiatives at each level. This is precisely the strength of Achieve. It's almost its raison d'etre. <laughs> so we need to figure out how to coordinate this stuff and we need to rethink alignment, recognizing that we're gonna have redundancy in the system, that we're not just trying to build one pathway through, but that we'll have parallelism in what many students take in their first year of college and what other students take in high school. Go ahead. I would, first of all, um, I think that you, from a state perspective, you have to consider th three things. First, what's your intended goal? Secondly, who's your intended audi audience? And thirdly, think about all the unintended consequences of your actions. And whatever you do has to be done within the context of your own state. You have to do a thorough analysis of all of your policies, 
um, not just the standards you have in place, but look at your graduation requirements, all the accountability provisions, and uh, look at the data. Uh, the data is going to drive most of your decision making because if if what you have uh, is um, is achieving the goal that you desire, then you have no basis for change. But say in Virginia, I wasn't happy with the number of students who were exiting high school uh, not having Algebra II or a rigorous alternative. Uh, Algebra II is not a graduation requirement for all students in Virginia. Um, but in order to get our highest level diplomas, it cer most certainly is plus more. And so we have, uh, even without Algebra II being a hard, fast graduation requirement, uh, we had two-thirds of our students taking Algebra II. So I was concerned about the, the one-third. And in analyzing those, most of those were students pursuing a career in technical education uh, pathway. But I wanted them to go into high-tech jobs. So my goal was to, re and goal and audience really were the CTE students but I also wanted to make sure that I could always get them back over to another pathway. And that was looking at an unattended uh, uh, consequence that I wanted to, uh, to make sure that I avoided. To, uh, not, uh, to, uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't uh, put a roadblock uh, uh, in there for them. And I wanted a rigorous, uh, rigorous uh, college-ready uh, course. Uh, stakeholder involvement is, is important. And I will have to tell you, as a mathematics uh, educator, unless you have the mathematics teachers, the mathematics uh, professional organizations on board in your state to what you want to do, they will put a roadblock up every step of the way. So the first thing that I did was call together a focus group. Some of my close friends in the community of, of mathematics that I worked with over many years in this profession and uh, got some buy-in. And once I got uh, an agreement from them that we needed an alternative, but a rigorous alternative, I put them to work to help us design the course before we ever went, in, went out uh, for, for any kind of uh, draft review or I went to the State Board of Education for approval. Stakeholder involvement, especially within the ranks of the mathematics community, that's just essential. Do you want to go to questions? Because I can, we want to, Yes, let's go to questions from the audience. I appreciate it, by the way, Pat's uh, initial point is l take a look at your data and see if you have a problem first. If it's not broke, don't fix it, in other words, and then figure out what problem you're trying to solve. Um, and to Uri's point, uh, engaging your stakeholders, we heard that again through Pat. Okay, question, tell us who you are and ask a question. We have about 10 minutes for okay. questions. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Presley with the Association for Public and Land Grant uh, Universities, our new title, and I'm involved in the Science and Math Teacher Imperative. And my question is, what are the implications of this for how we should be training new teachers? We know that many people become teachers because they're scared of math, you know, and so this seems as if this second path would be helpful for at least getting that grounding. But what should the path to teacher preparation look like in light of how you're thinking about mathematics? Well, I'll jump in and tell you some personal opinions um, and, and also some, some, I think, based on data. Um, I mean, I have three degrees in mathematics, and I can tell you that um, if, if, I, uh, if people deem that I was successful as a high school mathematics teacher, it certainly wasn't because of the role models I had in higher ed. I certainly got the grounding in the discipline. And I, and I believe I develop, developed that mathematical decision-making ability and some logical thinking. But in terms of my delivery of instruction, be able to take the content itself and translate that to young people uh, using uh, technology, graphical representations, modeling, and applications of mathematics, I had to acquire that over time uh, with some hard lessons learned. And so the one thing that I would suggest is that in higher education, I've been trying to drive this home in Virginia, is that you know, we're, we're, we're embedding technology within our classrooms, whether it's graphing calculators, uh, spreadsheets, techno hard technology software, but graphical tools, and that's very important in mathematics. But when they go to the four-year uh, university, uh, oh, that's no, we don't use technology. We don't use graphing calculators. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, they'll let them use computers but not graphing calculators when, when in fact graphing calculators today are no more than many computers. 
And so, you know, I've been trying to break that mold uh, in the higher ed institutions because I don't want our students who are getting the state-of-the-art instruction in mathematics at the high school to be penalized when they go to a four-year uh, institution. With the use of technology, more higher ed uh, institutions acknowledging the role of technology, modeling and using the technology, um, I think that can help more students better understand the mathematics that's being delivered because representations are important and that's why I'm so high on this new course. Every piece of content in this new course, Algebra Functions Data Analysis, is taught through a graphical or mathematical modeling uh, approach. Hi, I'm Bernie Sandrick from Maryland, and I'm a mathematics professor. Um, one of the things that happened in Maryland is there is a huge push to use technology at the elementary, middle school, and high school level. And so as we've had our large number of discussions, what you get from the math professor level is this pushback and the reason we feel so many students are placing into developmental, even though they've got technically more math, is because they don't have number skills. You know, they can't multiply without their calculators. They don't have the ability to graph a line, even though they've been graphing lines on their calculators for years. They can't transfer that knowledge to a piece of paper. And so we've been arguing about the dilemma of the fact that the technology has not improved students' mathematical understanding. And we don't think it's fair to say, well, the teachers aren't doing it right. We really are thinking that in the brain, you have to have done some paper in order for that technology to make any sense. And so we're advocating for actually a huge change in elementary and middle school education to get rid of some of that technology so that then your new alternative math course, which they've been teaching in Maryland for a long time, is effective. You know, it doesn't help you to see a graph if you've never put enough math into your brain for that, that graph to make sense. The alternative path, I think, is, is already in place in many, many places that are using graphing calculators. In fact, it's become the standard path. We need a way of getting that statistics in there. And here are going to be the roadblocks. As a mathematics major, I did not take a statistics course. I happened to have taken a probability course, but it was an elective. So before we can put statistics into the high schools, which it's desperate needed. We're going to have to make a major change in the amount of statistics math majors are required to take as they become teachers. So that's your first issue. The second issue as a community college person, my developmental program is supposed to get people to the same level they need to be at because 90% of my students are transferring to a four-year institution. So I have to fill that gap. So then my question becomes, as I redesign my developmental program, does statistics become one of the developmental pieces? Because if students are going to learn statistics in high school, which I hope they do, then the college level course should be at a higher level than that statistics course we're teaching right now. Because it's not necessarily the world's greatest course. And we like to hide that fact sometime. But students walk out of freshman statistics thinking, oh, now I know statistics, and they've learned this much. In fact, that little teeny bit of knowledge may actually be dangerous because they think they know so much more than they really do. So we have a couple of problems. We need statistics teachers at the college level and the high school level, right? And then we need to move all the way through the program and say, okay, if this is what we need in high school, then what will become the new ground for college? Because I hope we're just not going to teach them the same course all over and say that they've met their math requirement in college. And last of all, we have the problem of our other disciplines. Believe me, the math people groaned 
when college algebra became the prerequisite course for nursing. We didn't make that decision. We thought it was a terrible decision. But the nursing people made that decision because they want to use us as a filter. And so if you make it easier for people to get through that course, you'll have what happened at our top nursing school. Now they not only need college algebra, they need a B. So I think there's a simple solution. Every year that math is used as a filter, my cone should be at the White House. <laughs> and there should be a giant spinner. And Mike spins it, and if it comes up art, that year art gets to be the filter. It would be helpful. Instead of our beloved mathematics. Right. <laughs> Most of the people in my calculus program right now are pre-med, not engineers. I just want to say to both of these, technology is a very, calculators, computers are very powerful tools. All powerful tools can be used stupidly and badly, right? How do people, so we have to pay attention to how people learn to use them. On teacher education, in 1997, we had seven math majors out of 350 pursuing secondary certification. This year, about half of our 500 math majors are doing that. And as freshmen, they're out in elementary schools. As sophomores, they're out in middle schools. As juniors, they're out in high schools. And they're, we've reorganized, and you teach our program, we've reorganized instruction around using mathematics for teaching and using mathematics for work in the real world. And it's actually getting my department to change the way it teaches. We may get rid of the rule that says no technology in calculus. It may finally happen. I think we have time for one final comment. Um, Mike Cohen, final parting <laughs> words. I thought I ought to get up here before Uri gave us any more assignments this morning. Uh, but, but I want to take, up, take you up on, on, on one of the challenges that you, you made, the idea of thinking through what uh, a Virginia-like uh, alternative course might uh, look like. Uh, if there are states that are interested in thinking about that, and if we could persuade some of our panelists to be part of that, in fact, all of the panelists, to help out in that in some way or another, we'd be more than open to hearing from you and to figuring out how we might go about taking that challenge on uh, together. And if that turns out to be a, the joyous conspiracy uh, that Uri said it would. Hell, we love joyous conspiracies, so just bring it on. Absolutely. I love how Mike ended on the note of committing us to more work in the future. That seems perfect. I want to thank our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much. They've given us a lot of things to think about, very provocative, um, and a good place to segue into the next session, which is about pushback on the college and career ready agenda, much of which, I have to say, comes from this concern about mathematics and whether the mathematics um, is too much for some kids. So stay where you are. Folks are going to come in and join us, and I'm going to turn this over to Matt Gandel.